here to introduce Yuri. Um, all of you know, he is an associate professor in EECS and member of IDSS and LID. Um, so just a little bit about Yuri. He uh, did okay in uh, some international Olympiad in physics at the end of last century. Um, and he went on to uh, do his undergraduate at, uh, in applied mathematics and uh, physics from MIPT, not to be confused with MIT. That's a Moscow Institute for Physics and Technology. Uh, that was 2005, and his PhD was uh, from ECS or electric, electrical engineering from Princeton 2010. So his research is in information theory, statistical learning and error correcting codes, wireless communication, fault tolerance. Um, he is also an avid hockey player, uh, but I guess that's less, less relevant here, though we want to make sure that he wears helmet to protect his most valuable asset. Um, uh, he has won many awards, which we will not list here. Um, and uh, um, I'll just say that many of us know Yuri as a kind of a polymath. I remember asking him a while back what his plans were for a school vacation, and he said that it will be an algebraic geometry vacation. I asked whether this is in a, a place in the Caribbean, and uh, no, it turned out to be a real uh, algebraic uh, geometry vacation where he is Curiosity, you know, curiosity-driven and uh, person. And he is interested in many different subjects. And uh, today we'll talk about uh, some very surprising results about non-parametric estimation. So, looking forward to your talk. Well, Sasha, thanks a lot. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm humbled by your uh, introduction. Uh, it's almost correct, I think. Yes. Yeah, so, thanks a lot. Yes, uh, I didn't learn much in that algebraic geometry vocation, but I tried at least. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so today's token uh, is on non-parametric maximum likelihood. And this is joint work with my uh, dear friend and colleague from Yale Statistics Department, Yihong Wu. Okay, so, and that's a picture of us a while back. Uh, okay, sorry, the slide does not work. Okay, so first of all, let me just uh, spend a few uh, sort of, uh, you know, a few minutes uh, introducing uh, some motivation for the mixture models, right? So, uh, in the statistics departments, right, when we teach uh, intro stats courses, right, we like to mention this mixture, mixture, famous, some famous mixture models. Uh, so here I, I took the picture from Eric Price's and uh, Moritz Hart's paper. Uh, this is the distribution of heights of, uh, of humans, right? And uh, uh, you can see that it it's, doesn't look very Gaussian, right? But if you actually condition on the label, namely the gender, then, you know, the distribution becomes very Gaussian. Uh, so you for each subpopulation. And then of course, uh, the question of the Gaussian mixture model learning is to uh, learn the components from unlabeled data, right? So in some sense, in the modern speak, we should say that, you know, mixture model, studying mixture models is, I guess, uh, a topic in unsupervised learning. Actually, last week we had a speaker, right? Who was talking about clustering. Uh, and he also mentioned that this is, you know, Gaussian mixture models are, can be thought of as uh, unsupervised learning. Um, okay, in any case, so, right, so when I give this talk in statistics departments, that's my main motivation. And, uh, you know, there's, there is the Pearson and his poor crabs, right? And then we all know and love this, uh, this Gaussian mixture uh, models. Now, I should, so since this is my home, right, so home department, I, I mean, I can be honest and I, I want to tell you that this is not the reason I like this uh, topic. Honestly, I find this very boring this motivation, but this is what got me into, into, into the, you know, uh, into NPMLE and non-parametric maximum likelihood and then mixture modeling. So here is the problem, which uh, I hope maybe we'll have time to talk about in, at, uh, at the end. Uh, so suppose you, you know, you're interested in the following prediction question, right? So you have your favorite hockey player and you know, he scored 33 goals last season. Uh, and again, when I created the slide, uh, it was not yet understood that, you know, the season 2020, 2021 will be slightly different uh, from the regular season. But let's suppose there was no disruption, right? No COVID disruption. So, you know, you know how many goals he scored last season. You want to predict how many goals he will score next season, right? So the question is, how do you do it? And, you know, because he's relatively new, you don't have a lot of data about him. So it seems like, what, what can you do? You can just average his performance from a couple of last years, right? And that's it, right? But that sounds a little bit stupid, right? Because you say, hey, I have this enormous database for thousands of players, right? Spanning, uh, you know, almost a century. 
And somehow I'm only using five numbers about this guy. Can't I just be a little bit smarter, right? And the idea is that, yeah, you can, and you can dramatically improve your prediction by, uh, by, doing, by modeling, you know, uh, performance of, of players as a Poisson mixture model, right? And trying to undo sort of the, the noisy observation effect, right? By trying to first learn the mixture, sort of the, the distribution of the original talent in the population, and then doing the Bayesian prediction. Right, so that's the topic known as empirical bias. And again, that's what actually excites me in the mixture modeling. And that's actually the reason that uh, NPMLE, non-parametric maximum likelihood, um, became sort of uh, gained renewed interest in, in, in 2009 or thereabout, when people started noticing how amazingly it performs in uh, empirical bias. Okay, so here's the math setup for uh, those of you who don't uh, remember what uh, mixture models are. So we have a parametric density of, uh, the, uh, of uh, parametric family of densities, P sub theta, right? And uh, uh, there is some unknown prior on the parameter space. Uh, by the way, can you guys see my, my, my uh, pointer? Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, right, so, so we have some unknown uh, prior, right? And then what we observe are, are samples from the mixed density, right? From the density averaged over this prior. Okay, and then, right, the goal is from n IAD samples, you want to learn pi. Again, so if you're, a if you're a signal processing guy, right, you should say this is a deconvolution problem, right? Uh, but uh, in statistics, this is traditionally known as uh, mixture modeling. Okay, so let's, so I will mostly in this talk focus on the Gaussian mixture example, right, where this parametric family is the Gaussian location model with fixed variance, right? So P sub theta of X is going to be phi, uh, this is the standard density of x minus theta, right? And then you can compute, right, that uh, the average density over, uh, over parameters theta, right, when you average this, convolu the, this uh, shifted uh, Gaussian bumps, you get a convolution, right? So whenever I talk about uh, mixed density, uh, you can think of it as a convolution of uh, a known measure phi, which is standard Gaussian bump, with some crazy unknown pi, right? Could be discrete, could be some you know counter distribution. We don't care, right? But the resulting density is of course well defined. All right. So the special case that we are many of us are familiar with is the case when pi is a collection of k discrete uh, discrete parameters. That's actually was the topic of uh, Hart and Price paper, right? For k equals two, um, right? And so. So here, right, we get a sum of uh, just a discrete sum of a bunch of Gaussians. And then the question is, okay, how do you learn these parameters, right? These weights and locations. And as we, as, okay, again, if you worked on this, you, you know that uh, uh, it's tough to infer these parameters, right? Even though it's a parametric modeling question, but the likely, likelihood function is non-convex. So you have to be smart. You cannot just run the, you know, vanilla gradient descent. So there are clever tricks like expectation maximization. Uh, but even those clever tricks still can get stuck in local uh, local uh, minima or maxima and not get you optimal performance. So what's the resolution? So there is other uh, there are other ideas, right? Uh, so starting from the original, you know, uh, Pearson Crab example, uh, one of the popular method is the method of moments, uh, where of course we uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the moments of the mixed density with the empirical moments observed uh, from the population, right? And uh, and then that's how we, by solving the inverse equations, right? Uh, we're trying to uh, learn pi and Pearson had to solve degree nine equation, right? With two roots, anyways, standard story. Okay, so the second, uh, the second uh, thing, the second idea is the minimum distance estimator of Wolfowitz, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize the distance between the, uh, this uh, piece of pi, again, parameterized by uh, mixing density, right? And empirical distribution, great idea. And the third is what is the topic of today is the non-parametric model. Uh, which distance this, did Wolfowitz recommend using? Uh, he didn't, so you can use your own, yes. So okay. that's, 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 that's what I was gonna say in a second. That, uh, right, so non-parametric maximum likelihood is I will describe in a second. Uh, actually, I, in the, even in my abstract, I say Kiefer Wolfowitz, but uh, yesterday I was bored and I studied this a little bit. Actually, uh, the introduction of NPMLE, I will call it NPMLE from now on, uh, actually was 
introduced by Robbins in like a three line abstract where he just said, okay, this is the idea and this is what it will give us. It's consistent. And though Kiefer and Wolfowitz, you know, waited and waited for the full paper and it never came out. So they actually had to prove it themselves. So that's an interesting story. In any case, so the point is in the first two methods, as, as nice as they are, there are some tuning parameters, right? You have to select number of moments in, two, in the minimum distance, as Philippe said, you have to select the distance, right? So, uh, and NPMLE is nice because there's nothing to select, right? In some sense, it's a completely self-contained recipe, right? So what is this recipe? So the recipe is very simple, but also completely insane if that's the first time you see it, right? So it says the following, it says, well, let's, because PISA pi is a nice little PDF, right? For every pi. So why don't we just compute the log likelihood, right? For every pi and just maximize it over the space of all priors, right? So, so even if perhaps we're interested in, you know, finitely many uh, Gaussian uh, bumps, right? So in, in, in the K component Gaussian mixture, we forget about this fact, right? And we're just running the full blown maximization over all, um, over all input distributions, right? So this space includes the counter distributions and all the insane distributions you can think of. Okay, so, so this looks completely crazy, right? So how can uh, this be a good idea, right? Uh, and why is this crazy? Well, first of all, this is in, this is a uh, we went from the finite dimensional problem, right, for k component modeling, to infinite dimensional, right. Now we are trying to solve over this gigantic space of uh, of distributions on the compact set, right, or or non-compact, but for us it's going to be compact, right. But the good news is that the problem became convex, right. So that's, uh, so that's the interesting situation here, right? So we trade con non-convexity so for dimension. Okay, so, and let's see what it gives us. Um, yeah, so before we actually start talking about this, let me mention this uh, sort of rough idea that, you know, NPMLE is also a minimum distance estimator in where distances can be taken in quotes, right? Because- yes, Yuri, go from probability here. Sorry, what, say it again. Oh, sorry, sorry. Was there a question? Sorry. No, oh. just that. Oh, so just, uh, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so um, so we can think of NPMLE also as a minimum distance, right? Where you're trying to minimize the distance between the empirical and uh, the mixed distribution where this distance is KL divergence. Again, uh, KL divergence, of course, is not exactly a distance, but yeah, you can think about it like this. Uh, there are other uh, cool uh, equivalent re equivalence relations. Um, so you can, if you're an information theorist, then the problem of minimizing KL divergence with respect to second coordinate over a linear space is what we call ray distortion theory, right? Because that's exactly equivalent to minimizing mutual information subject to some uh, coupling constraint, right? And there is also a fantastic connection to optimal transport, which uh, John Weed and Philippe uh, observed in 2018, right? Is actually that minimizing the uh, KL divergence, right? This, this problem, which is NPMLE, right? Is equivalent to minimizing uh, the entropic optimal transport between uh, the mixing measure and the, and the empirical distribution. So in any case, so whenever I state the results, right? If you're not excited about NPMLE, Hopefully you can go back and say, okay, I don't care about his NPMLE implication, right? But I really like the ray distortion implication or the imp or the optimal transport uh, stuff. Okay, so maybe uh, let's see how what's uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to mention a few of the standard algorithms, but let me just skip this. So let me just say that yeah. So you know, in information theory, people looked at this and they came up with what is known as Blaihut Arimoto algorithm, and uh, that's essentially is equivalent to uh, expectation maximization. In statistics literature, I will review this in, a, in a, shortly. Uh, this problem uh, gained a lot of attention, right, from over the decades. And uh, so some of the important results are things like existence, uniqueness, and discreteness of the optimizer, right? So this, this we will review, as I said. Um, and you know there are lots of iterative algorithms. There are you know hundreds of papers written on the performance of NPMLE. And again, I will mention all of this later. For now, let's just ignore, uh, skip this. 
Okay, so summary is we have this nice little algorithm, right? It has no tuning parameters. There's no regularization penalty, nothing, right? So computation seems to be, I mean, because it's a convex problem, right? We should be expecting that it's doable, right? Now, uh, I will mention that there is a guarantee is that, you know, the density uh, derived by the NPMLE actually achieves also almost parametric rate uh, in terms of Hellinger distance in the estimation. So it's a, you know, it's a very accurate estimate, provably. And as I said, the resurgence of interest is m mostly because econometricians, uh, such as Roger Conker, right, they observed that there is amazing performance when, when you use NPMLE in, in this, uh, you know, large scale prediction problems. Okay, now what I'm interested in in this talk is is this issue, right, that is, that is, I mean, of interest to lots of us in this seminar, right, is, isn't this over-parameterization harmful, right? So, I mean, we gave this algorithm such a huge, right, flexibility to select any mixing distribution without any regard to the number of atoms, right? It could be even continuous, right? Uh, and, and then, of course, we want to un understand to what extent does NPMLE overfit, right? And the other question is, well, for example, suppose you are you have a you know a, an actual K component Gaussian mixture, right? And the question is, what's the model size, right? What's the number of components that NPMLE will return, right? And again, you have to trust me that you know all of those hundreds and hundreds of papers written on NPMLE and mixture models do not answer this question, right? Okay, so so let's uh, let's start addressing this. Okay, so first of all, let's uh, let's do the following. So we have to maximize some function of the distribution, right? L of pi, written here again, uh, and uh, and again. So if you mix the if you miss the the definition of p sub pi for Gaussian mixture, this is just convolution of pi and and the Gaussian bump, uh, smoothing of pi by the Gaussian bump, right? Okay, so if you write down the first order KKT conditions, right? You can say, okay, let's perturb the potential solution by hat, right, by adding a delta bump at some uh, parameter uh, theta, right? And this should lead to a uh, non-increase of, um, of the likelihood, right? So you can figure out the following criterion that if pi hat is to be optimal, then, okay, so this is, this is very important. So there are several times in this talk where I need you to remember something, and this is one of them, right? So you need to, to remember that there is this function d pi hat of theta, right, which is defined here, right? So it's a, it's it's given by the sum of uh, of the parametric densities, right? P of theta at xi, and this is the parameter where we are evaluating this, right? Normalized by the mixed density at the same data points, right? Remember, xi's are the data points, right? These are the heights of people or something like this, right? Which, uh, which in my data set. And for pi hat to be optimal, right, you have to be, uh, you have to satisfy this condition. It's actually not just necessary, but necessary and sufficient here, it turns out. Okay, so, right, so, and now notice that something interesting happens. So we have this KKT condition, right? This should hold, so if pi hat is optimal, this function should be upper bounded by one everywhere. So let's average this function over pi hat itself. Right. So when we average it, you can see that the, the numerator becomes p pi hat itself, right? And so they cancel, and we get the following statement, right? So this is the if that's the first time you see it, this is really looks dramatic. But again, th this is this was used in Blaho Tarimoto in information theory for a long time, right? It's a standard effect in some sense, right? That the optimal distribution somehow satisfies the following two properties. First of all, there is this function of theta, right, on the parameter space which is guaranteed to be upper bounded by one. On the other hand, when you average it over the distribution, you should get exactly one, right? What it means is that uh, the optimal measure is supported on the global maximizers of this function, right? Always. So, so there's, right? So we should just locate the maximums of this function and that's where the optimal measure sits, right? Okay, now, of course, the, the I mean, this is completely useless because you don't know this function, right? T pi hat of theta. Uh, I mean, it depends on pi hat itself, right? But in principle, this is a nice observation, right? And we actually, we will relax even that and we will just say, okay, forget about global maximizers, right? Let's even look at the critical points of this function. Okay. Um, 
Is there a question? I, I can hear some. Hey, Yuri, it's uh, Tohid here. Yes. That function, what does it mean intuitively, that D function? Uh, we'll see. It's actually for Gaussian mixture, it's mixture itself. Oh. You will, you will see. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a funny situation that, yeah, for when you analyze Gaussian mixtures, this crazy D function actually is a mixture itself, a Gaussian mixture itself. Yeah. Right. And, and this right. will lead. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, it's understandable. It's not crazy function. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Good to see you, Tohid. Okay. Uh, right. So actually, this is what I'm doing here on this slide. Yes. Uh, so for the Gaussian mixture case, right? What we can do is again, so we just write this uh, P of theta right back again. And then we can see that this function D of theta is itself a mixture of N Gaussians, right? Now notice that this time it's, it's again a mixture, right? But uh, the locations of the mixture are known. They are data points, right? The weights are unknown to us because they are related to one over the density or the optimal density. Okay, but in any case, it's a, it's a nice situation, right? There's a function which is N Gaussian mixture and the standard old school results on, uh, right? So this becomes an exponential polynomial, right? And then, you know, uh, uh, the giants of, uh, of last century, right? Figured out that, okay, uh, things, things like this behave nicely in the sense that they cannot have more than uh, two N minus one critical points and uh, therefore N maximums, right? And this leads us to this famous characterization of Lindsay Right, who proved that okay, a non-parametric maximum likelihood exists. Right, so the solution to that uh, infinite-dimensional convex problem always exists. Um, it is actually unique, so this does not follow from the argument I said, but uh, it requires some extra totally positive kernel stuff. But in any in any case, so it exists. It's unique, and you can prove that actually it's discrete. Right, and the number of points is n is at most n. Right. So this was a this was a uh, I mean this was sort of what cemented the NPMLE right as a as a as a valid solution because you're running this over parameter over parameterized feet and at least it returns you know discrete distribution with not crazy number of points right at least it's order n okay so now of course I mean if your n is gigantic then this is still bad idea right and uh, yeah so the question is can we improve this estimate right and that's the topic of today. Right, so, okay, so here's a quick experiment. So if you put red dots, so this is my sample, right? So 11 points, equispaced, you run NPMLE, it returns the 11, 11 model Gaussian, right? So, so sorry, 11 mixture, right? So, so th this shows you that Lindsay's theorem is tight in the worst case, right? But, uh, right, so, and that's why uh, in some sense it's futile to try to improve it, right? But the good news is that in practice, you would never see a sample like this. Right, so what you would see is a sample of something like this, right? So this is a random sample from a two component Gaussian mixture. And you can see that here NPMLE actually fits two weights, right? So two component mixture, right? Fit on the sample and exactly a two, you know, a two component mixture. So, you know, so this and many, many, you know, thousands of experiments ran by practitioners. And here I mostly refer, I mean, my, I'm not a practitioner, right? As of course you guys all know, but, uh, so my experience is from talking to Roger Conker uh, and from reading his papers, right? So in particular, okay, so here's a sort of a small scale experiment uh, we ran with Yihong ourselves. So we tried to generate thousand samples from, a, from this distribution, right? Which corresponds to single component. This is Gaussian mixture with one uh, mixture, um, right? And so we ran this NPMLE uh, I mean, some version of it. And this is the histogram of the number, right? So Lindsay tells us the number of atoms in the solution will be less than 10,000. We see something like, you know, four to 14, right? E e experimentally. And again, so uh, Roger Coinker, right? The, the, uh, he, he, he studied this for a long time and then he sort of put forward this uh, uh, mild conjecture that, that, okay, it should grow as square root n, right? So n is two, two sort of too pessimistic. So typically for a typical sample, it should be a square root n, right? And so this is where finally I can state our main results. So here's what we proved. Uh, we proved that, okay, first of all, it's a completely, non -non -deter completely deterministic result, right? Give me a data set com consisting of x1 up to xn. Uh, and then we proved that the support, the number of atoms is always upper bounded by the range squared, right? So this is the range of your data, max minus mean squared. Right, multiplied by some constant. Okay, again, so uh, sort of, yeah, this is like, uh, this is the 
point where I need to apologize a little bit, right? Because uh, I mean, Yi Hong and I should have worked harder and actually pinned down this constant, right? But it's a nice constant. So think of it as like five or 10, right? It's, it's, not, it's not some Ramsey tower or something, right? So it's a, it's a nice constant. Okay, and now, so once we have this explicit bound, right? It's completely deterministic statement, right? Uh, we can derive the corollary, which I stated in the abstract for this talk, right? That if you have data generated ID from some sub-Gaussian mixture of Gaussians, right? Then, well, with high probability, this range is going to be square root log n, right? And that's why the support of NPML is going to be log n, right? So this is, uh, okay, this was a little bit shocking to us, at least initially, right? I will, sh I will tell you why in a few slides. But uh, actually, the guy who conjectured the square root n, right? So he was even more impressed. He said, oh, wow, uh, I would never guess, right? In my Because, you know, it's, in this experiment, it's very tough to see the difference between log n and square root n. But log n seems to be very, you know, uh, very low. OK, so that's, uh, so this is the main statement. Right, so again, so just to summarize, uh, in case uh, I was not clear, right? So the previous best bound was n. We reduced it to log n. Uh, Right, so in particular, right, if you're if you're fitting a sample from the K component Gaussian mixture, we prove that it's you know you will never fit more than log n atomic mixture. Uh, I should again say there's one interesting open question here is that we don't know if NPMLE will actually always fit log n density, right? So we don't have a lower bound. It could be in principle, it's not unproven, it's not it doesn't violate any results that I know that NPMLE possibly may return, if you run it very, very long time, maybe it actually returns exactly the K component mixture, you know? So that's not ruled out by the known results. Okay, and then I only state the Gaussian location mixture result, but we actually prove it for all exponential families whose tail is slightly super exponential. So that's a one annoying open question here uh, that we cannot prove it for, uh, for exactly exponential tail. And in particular, actually, okay, I'll talk about it later. For now, let's let me just uh, maybe take a pause and then uh, take questions if, if if there are any on the main result. Uh, Yuri, perhaps I I'm, I'm I'm sorry I missed the beginning. So pi could be a continuous mi mixture, right? It doesn't need to be atomic mixture. Correct. Yes. So as long as it's sub-Gaussian, I mean, for this, yeah, as I said, the first part of the result is completely deterministic, right? It just says if you run the algorithm and PMLE on any collection of points, they don't have to be generated by anything, right? They could be like a grid, right? Or I don't know, anything, right? So you're always guaranteed to get number of atoms, which is upper bounded by constant uh, times the range squared. So then I missed, what's K in, in your, this is K mixture, <laughs> K mixture Gaussian? Uh, in per, I mean, in particular, right, if pi is K Gaussian mixture, then this applies because it, I mean, K Gaussian mixture is one sub Gaussian, right? Because I, and, I mean, support and the talk. That perhaps you can actually recover not just log n, which is growing with n, but actually K. Is that is that what you were saying? This would be, uh, you will see that it's highly unlikely. I think that the true answer here is that NPMLE, even for one Gaussian mixture, Meaning, if if you just give it, feed it samples from IAD Gaussian, I suspect that it will still return log n atoms, but I cannot prove right. it. Got it. Yeah, Good. actually, log n over log log n is 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 the is the answer probably. I see. I yes, see. but we don't have a lower bound. Got it. Yeah. Hey Yuri. Yes. So if you have more than log n components in your mixture, like maybe root n or something, the this algorithm will actually mush them together, the the clusters in the a smaller number. Correct. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, you will. So we will discuss this in a second. Yes. So, okay. So now here comes the question, right? So, I mean, you will see the proof of this result is not hard, right? This is not some, you know, I'm not going to mention any Borgains or, or, or any like cool, cool people, right? In this connection. But so why, why I was excited about this, right? Why I keep giving this talk is, is the following observation. And that's what we call self-regularization. Uh, okay. So. Uh, hey, Yuri, one more question. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, do you have intuition for why, um, like the square is the right growth rate here? Uh, you will see. And the answer, I mean, you will like like the proof. I will I will actually talk about the proof. Yes, Bryce. And you will see that it's related to some combinatorial stuff. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, but the honest answer is no. Yes. But you, okay. I will show you the proof, and then you'll be a little bit more excited, I think. Yeah. But hold on one sec. Yes. So, OK. Uh, 
Right. So, okay. So let me now tell you where, why we were so shocked at this, right? So this, this is, I mean, I still don't understand how this is possible, but okay. But let me go for this, right? So once we prove this log n, we asked ourselves, okay, uh, can we maybe improve this, right? Maybe log n is not good, right? Maybe it's log log n, right? In the in truth, right? Okay. So, so here's the argument to, to convince you that it's not possible. So first of all, so Yi Hong, uh, you know, a decade ago, computed the following thing. So he he noticed that if I give you, if pi right is true mixing distribution, is actually Gaussian itself, right? So the mixed distribution becomes Gaussian with slightly fatter, right? If you try to match that fatter Gaussian by a finite mixture of you know variance one Gaussians, you have to you have to suffer Hellinger loss, which is of this kind, right? So. Right, so that's so, and that's a moments calculation, right? You have to match some moments, right? Okay, so now we apply the following indirect thinking. We say, okay, now suppose you have any estimator of of the mixed density, which achieves poly polynomial in n decaying Hellinger, right? This means that this estimator has to have logarithmic number of atoms, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? Okay, so. At least for the mixing distribution, which is Gaussian itself, right? Okay, so now there is a famous theorem of of uh, Kun Hui Zhang, right? Who proved that NPMLE actually achieves log log n over square root n, so it, it does achieve poly n, right? Which implies it cannot have smaller than uh, log n atoms, right? Because of this conclusion. Okay, so this was cool, right? So okay, at least our estimate is sharp for NPMLE, but this is not shocking, right? So far. Okay, I mean, we proved the tight bound. Uh, I mean, otherwise I wouldn't give a talk, right? But uh, now here is the actually exciting part. So you see, I mean, in some sense, log n is the smallest number you can hope for. Here is why. So I think, uh, so Tauhid asked this question before, right? So suppose you you have Gaussian mixture, right? And you have n samples from it. Again, a method of moments calculation tells you the following: that for any sub-Gaussian mixture, right, there exists a k-atomic, uh, k-atomic simulation of it, right, k-atomic approximation to it, whose Hellinger distance is a little low of one over square root n, right, and and the number of components in that is logarithmic, right, which means that you for any mixture model with more than logarithmic number of atoms, right? You can always simulate it statistically indistinguishably, right? By log n number of atoms, right? So that's that's the surprising part, right? In some sense, I give you the ability to look at Gaussian mixtures of arbitrary distributions, right? But with n samples, there is a limit to how complex your models are, right? Because there is no reason to go beyond log n Right, because log n is where you can simulate any mixture. Just n samples are not enough to distinguish these models, right? And somehow NPMLE just you know it's not instructed to do that, right? But somehow it magically you know lands the solution at exactly that scale, right? So this I guess this is a one-dimensional phenomenon, right? What happens in higher dimensions? Ah, excellent question, uh, Elkanan. Everything is open. Yes, uh, existence, uniqueness, discreteness, everything is open in d dimensions, and it's related to you know. Like Bernd Sturmfels and 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 his colleagues, right? So they actually study a lot of. I mean, there are a lot more basic questions there than NPMLE, even for Gaussian mixtures in even in two dimensions. I will t I will mention in the in the last. I mean, yeah, it's actually <laughs> so funny that we mention algebraic geometry all the time. But it's uh, uh, there is connections to algebraic geometry there. So yes, I'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay. In any case, the summary is the following, right? So we have the sequence of models. Right, one component mixtures, two component, k component, right, and they are nested. And we, what I, what I sort of, okay, I didn't prove it, but I, I, I mentioned this, right, that the statistical degree, right, the, the natural height of this model sequence is log n. For n samples, there is no reason to go beyond log n, and NPMLE automatically adapts to this, right. And this is what we, this is what I want. This is in the title of this talk, right. This is this sort of subtle property which I don't know how to, you know. How to advertise properly, right? But uh, we called it self-regularization, right? Somehow NPMLE strikes to, you know, completely maximize the likelihood without any model selection penalty. Something we teach our students not to do, right? In stats classes, but but at the same time, in this particular case, right? It's actually, you know, 
it of course overfits, right? But uh, because it doesn't select, give you the correct number of components, but it doesn't overfit insanely, right? It somehow lands at exactly the simulation degree, right? So anyway, so that's so that's the exciting part. Uh, let me mention a few more things about, uh, right? So, I mean, once you get this, right? So you can ask the question about model selection. Again, model selection and Gaussian mixtures is a rich topic, right? There are many, many papers written on this, right? So, so people ask the following question, right? If you optimize, we can't do it, but suppose we could, right? Actually compute the maximum likelihood over all K atomic mixtures, right? Then the question is, how do you select the right one, right? So how, and then there are theorems Okay, so what, first of all, what our theorem says is the following, that if you compute this maximum likelihood for different number of mixtures, it will flatten after log n, right? So it just becomes stationary. It doesn't increase anymore, which actually is already a nice idea, right? I mean, it kind of tells you roughly how to select, right? If you just take the range square normalized by the variance squared, right? That's a rough estimate of how many components you should even try, right? So that's, that's already useful for practice, I guess. Um, but anyway, so for model selection, there is, I guess, some interesting story. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that uh, if, you, if you're asking yourself a question, did people think about learning the number of components by this method? And yes, that's a, that's a proven thing. So in particular, this paper, Kerry Bean uh, 2000, it, uh, pr she proved uh, that, uh, um, yeah, that if you use something like you know big Bayesian information criterion or actually any other, uh, pretty much any other uh, slowly growing penalty term, then it does recover consistently the true model. But again, that probably doesn't happen for you know in, in, in sample sizes of interest to us. Okay. Uh, right. So at this moment, I wanted to mention some topic where. Yurim, can I ask something? Yes, I, yes. I, I'm sorry, I missed. I actually, the last bullet, I, I wanted to understand better. You're saying that there is uh, over parameterization, but, but it's, uh, it's not a problem. How does this estimation with that most log n components will perform on out of sample? Uh, good question. You mean in terms, of, in terms of the likelihood on the new component? I mean, you, you, you do this estimation, you have a sample, you do this estimation, you produce a distribution. How this, and then, and, and uh, how would that perform on the out of sample? I, I don't know. Right, so, but the, the, I mean, the, the question is how do we phrase this, right, this experiment? So you want to compare likelihoods, right? So you fit on n minus one, for example, data points, right? And then you evaluate on the nth, right? Yeah. So yeah. um, I didn't do this experiment. So the experiment that, again, that I keep referring to, right, that people do in empirical Bayes is they fit it, right? Uh, they fit this mixture and then they try to predict the next sample, but, uh, right. So, and then NPMLE works. I mean, again, I cannot tell you, you know, what, what, what it achieves in terms no, of- There's no theoretical guarantees. No. Got it. Yeah. Actually that's, yeah, so that's one thing. Okay, so I just realized I only have 10 minutes left and I wanted to talk about the proof. So let me skip connection to Granander estimator. Uh, but yeah, so that's, anyway, so there's some, yeah, so NPMLE was studied in for monotone, for isotonic regression, right? For monotone density estimation. And uh, yeah, so, uh, right. So actually, so let me tell you again, why we, why we were a little bit surprised about log n uh, bound. So, when we got it, right? So there is this theorem of Zhang, which says, okay, if you want to estimate in Hellinger distance, the Gaussian mixture, then NPMLE achieves this fantastic uh, uh, regret, right? Oh, sorry, not regret, that uh, precision, right? This is density estimation. There's no regrets. It's a honest question, right? You want to estimate the density, right? And so, uh, right, so this achieves this, this rate, right? Log square N over N. So it's almost parametric. Parametric rate would be, K over N, right? Uh, yeah, and his analysis is some empirical process stuff, right? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to, uh, this is actually how this work started in, in honesty, right? So uh, so we thought that if we can prove that NPMLE has blah number of components, then we can use the, the you know, the idea that uh, Hellinger estimation, right, rate is roughly number of parameters divided by N, right? So if NPMLE has M parameters, then we will get the rate, which is M over N, right? So this was our idea. And when we got log N, we were shocked because we said, oh my God, we are near something, right? This is a dream of proving 
tight result here, right? And there is no, it's known that log n over n is a lower bound. So we thought, okay, we settled this. That's it, right? So we can improve Zhang and settle finally the Hellinger complexity of Gaussian mixture estimation, right? The rate. But okay, unfortunately, it turned out that when, once we started executing this strategy, we picked up an extra log n factor. So there is no theorem for K Gaussian mixture, which gives us, uh, you know, K over N Hellinger estimation. It's probably clearable, this log N by doing uh, coupling, sorry, chaining methods, right? Like the, because this paper essentially uses no, ch doesn't use chaining. Uh, so, so that's one of the open questions here. Like maybe just by applying this, uh, our theorem plus slight improvement to, to the analysis of finite component, finite, finite Gaussian mixtures, which is a parametric class, right? So th that's why it's nice to analyze. Uh, so we could uh, write, so, but in any case, the summary is that our result plus parametric MLE story gives Zhang again. And it also explains why you get this log N, right? Because the number of components in NP MLE is log N. So essentially, uh, right, uh, okay. So that's, uh, that's another reason we were excited. Okay, let me skip this. Okay, so I promised Bryce to talk about the proof. So let's me, let me use the last uh, uh, 10 minutes for the proof because the proof is actually very easy. Okay, so let's start with the Poisson mixture case. So, uh, right, so, so the density in that case has the following uh, expression, right? It's theta to the power X divided by X factorial e to the minus theta. Okay, so again, we can uh, compute the same KKT condition Right, so this function d of theta, which is supposed to be upper bounded by one, right, is going to be given by this expression. What's important is that uh, it's transcendental function, but it's transcendentalness, right, is contain completely contained in this factor. So we can remove it, right, and we can ask the question: Okay, how many maxima can this function have, right? How many global maxima? And of course, I mean, uh, right. So it corresponds to computing the critical points, right? So if you remove this expo exponent, then the, the critical points of the polynomial, can you cannot have more than x max of them, right? Or order x max, right? Maybe two x max. No, actually, in this case, it's x max. The number of critical points is going to be number of, right? So, and that, that right? So actually, if you do it with more precision, you can show that in this case, in Poisson mixture model, the number of roots the number of atoms is always upper bounded by the number of distinct values you observe in your sample, right? Okay, so that's, uh, right, so okay, so that's very cool and very simple, right? And now you can see how you can get log n result for Poisson mixtures immediately, right? If you have a, if you have a nice mixing distribution, compactly supported or sub-exponential, right? The maximum value you will see is of order log n. So you get polynomial, you get to study number of critical points of unknown polynomial, but of degree log n. So it cannot have more than order log n roots. That's it, right? So that's the simple situation in Poisson, right? If you read this, you could say, I don't want to hear anything else. Everything, all other results are probably similarly simple. Well, there's one, you're, you're right. I mean, it took us three attempts to solve this. Uh, so, it's completely, I mean, natural idea, right? To try something similar, except that you're, when you try to apply it for Gaussian, right? This function is not a polynomial. So somehow here we use the cool property of polynomials, right? That their degree relates to the number of roots, right? But the question is how, what, what other property of, of function D of theta, which is Gaussian, which is itself Gaussian mixture, right? Remember for, for Gaussians, right? What property should we use? Okay. So let me, for that, right, let me re recall what is this function, right? So D of theta, as we remember, is itself a Gaussian mixture with N components, right? So it's pi, so this time, okay, I should have used some other letter. So this is pi, right, which has nothing to do with the mix, with the mixing, right? So we're now operating in the mindset that we have a fixed sample. There is no pi, right? It's X1 up to Xn deterministic points, right? So we are computing some mixture so d pi hat of theta is just a mixture of, of, of some unknown distribution and phi, right? And the standard Gaussian. We know that pi is supported on the samples, right? In particular, it lives in this range, x min minus, uh, to x max. Okay, so now Wait, we just- Pi is not a, a probability distribution, is it? 
Ah, yeah, sorry. So it's, you can normalize it, right? It doesn't matter because okay. we're, we're only counting the critical points, right? Okay. We, we, right. So, but that's a good observation because before I was talking that D is supposed to be upper bounded by one, right? So this, this is now not true, right? It's, it's no, we're no longer using this one, right? One was giving us scale. Now the scale is lost, right? So we, we only know the, we're only counting the number of critical points, right? So we have Gaussian convolution. We want to compute the number of critical points. Okay. So, so this is where, okay, if, if, some, if someone was spacing out or didn't care before, so this is completely self-contained analytical puzzle, which I, you know, I enjoyed solving, uh, right? So we have, we are playing the following game, right? So we have a measure on minus A to A and we are smoothing it by Gaussian. And our goal is to create maximum possible number of maxima, right? So that's a nice game, right? So combinatorially minded people Right, like Bryce would immediately try to solve it, right? So let's let's play with this, right? So so how would we do it? So let's let's try to do a two mixture Gaussian, right? So we put so my pi uh, leaves on minus two and two, right? Okay, so you can see that after I smooth it, I create two two humps, right? Two maxima. Okay, so that's pretty obvious, right? So if I move this maxima a little bit closer, I still have two maxima, right? Uh, sorry, the locations of Gaussians, right? But if I move them at the separation of one and one, you can see that the two bumps merge and they create only one maxima, right? Okay, that's very nice, right? So this tells us, right? So that uh, our intuition should be, right? So this is an 11 mixture, right? On, on the, on the, so it would, right? The number of bumps would be similar, but if you try to move them, squeeze them tighter, right? They would start disappearing, right? So then, uh, so what's what should be the conjecture, Bryce? So how many how many maxima can we create by packing arbitrary Gaussians on minus a to a? What do you think? What's the order? I would guess some linear number, like linear and a, right? It's completely in, obvious, in, in right? Here. Right, and that's what we tried to prove for a long time, right? So it's like you pack them, right? So it becomes a packing problem, right? Well, it turns out, uh, right, and so that's that's what we were trying to prove, right? Well, it turns out the correct answer is a square. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, so that's uh, yeah so that's something that uh, th that is hard to understand, right? So okay, so uh, not only right, so we proved that the upper bound of a square right first, and then we tried for a long time to prove a because we were sure the answer should be a right from this obvious. Uh, but then we actually came up with the following super simple uh, super simple example. First of all, I should notice that uh, so. To some right, with some surprise, good things happened in parallel, right? So people were studying some amplitude constraints, channel capacity. They actually proved the same upper bound and made the same conjecture that or, order A should be the tight answer. Uh, so here's our lower bound, which should actually explain why it works, right? So again, if you're a signal processing guy, you should remember that if you take a sinusoid and convolve with Gaussian, right? Then because convolution is linear operation, you just get a sinusoid, which is smaller, right? So this immediately tells you that the idea that somehow moving Gaussians together merges the bumps, right, uh, is wrong, right? Because if you convolve sinusoid of arbitrary high frequency, you convolve it with Gaussian, you get the same sinusoid back, right? So it will have infinitely many modes in arbitrary interval, right? Now, the only trick here is that sinusoid is not a probability distribution supported on minus a, a, right? So you have to truncate it a little bit, right? And that's what gives you a square. Anyway, so that's... Uh, so that's uh, that's the cool, uh, and I think a little bit. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's, it's I would never guess this, right? And as I said, we spend a lot of time trying to prove that A is tight, uh, and this was and failed. Okay, so now uh, going to the proof, right? So how do we prove an upper bound? That's the main story here. So the intuition is the following, right? So I, I promised you that we need to use some kind of property similar of general functions, right? similar to the property of polynomials. So what's the property of polynomials we need? Uh, so you see polynomials, right? If you have, suppose you have a polynomial, you know all its roots are in some circle, right? And you know there are gigantic number of them, right? Well, then it implies that this polynomial must grow like crazy asymptotically, right? Just by, because you, you can write it as a product, right? So you can see that from polynomials, right? You, you They have this interesting property, right? That uh, any polynomial which has a lot of roots, meaning it's highly oscillatory in a small region, right? It should become insanely large, uh, far away, 
right? So that's uh, that's the property. And it turns out that this property is also shared by general holomorphic functions, right? So so this is a uh, this is the theorem which states this fact, right? So uh, it's known as Jensen's formula. I mean, I'm sure for many of you it's a shock that uh, Jensen not only proved the uh, very inequality that we like, but also proved some very useful equality. Um, so, uh, right, so what it says is that if you sum uh, logarithms of uh, locations of zeros inside the, some disk, then it's exa this expression has exact, uh, I mean, can be also computed as the integral of the log, the magnitude of the function over some large circle, right? So basically function, right? So you can, you can, you can relate the number of and locations of zeros to the behavior of function on the large circle. Okay. And uh, equivalently, I mean, for us, we actually will convert Jensen's uh, ingenious equality to again, inequality. Uh, and uh, we'll just use it to bound the number of uh, zeros in a, in a small uh, disk. Okay, I I'm gonna use one more minute, uh, Sasha, sorry. And then I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, so, right, so the proof consists of the following steps, right? So we have a Gaussian convolution, pi convolve phi, right? And uh, so we want to count the number of real roots. So the first step is to notice that because u, right, is supported on minus AA, this derivative is either always negative or positive outside of the interval minus AA. So all the real roots of, of Gaussian convolution, right, all the critical points must be supported on minus AA, right? So, and then, okay, I, I had some hardship, right, to drawing this picture, so I really wanted to show it, uh, right? So. So now, right, what, we, what we're trying to do, we want to bound the number of zeros in this strip minus AA, right? Instead, we overbounding it by all the zeros in this circle, right? And then furthermore, to bound the number of zeros in this circle, we actually analyze behavior of the function on this further large circle, right? So that's, that's where the Jensen's formula come in, comes in. Again, if I had more time, I would convince you that this slide contains entirety of the proof uh, and the, uh, because the behavior of this Gaussian convolution, right, on the complex plane for the complex arguments x is going to be of order e to the a square, right? Okay. And uh, now this is slightly misleading because actually for the general exponential family, I mean, the proof is not so easy. I mean, it's a little bit different, but uh, for Gaussians it works, right? So basically the summary is this, right? So we, what we did is we tamed the behavior of the, unknown convolution, right? So we know how, 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 how large its growth is asymptotically, and therefore it implies it cannot have too many oscillations uh, in this smaller circle. And therefore in particular, it cannot have too many oscillations here, minus AA, right? So, so that's, that's the trick. And that's it. So I think I'm, I'm gonna stop here and maybe if, if, if there are questions, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address them. But uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening.